audio check. If uh, anybody has any questions at some point, just raise your hand. I'll run this mic back to you so that the people on the stream will be able to hear you. So where is he? So where is he was the question. Does anybody know? Donde esta ESR? What is it that you have there, Michael? Test. Speaker. Are we, uh, is it 1.30 yet? Yeah. Very good. Should get back from the buffet. steps. Thank you. I'm just going to fix this wire. Hold still for a second. Let me clip this to your pocket. 
please do. All right, very good. What are we setting up? Open street map. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Raymond, and I'm here to give you an, an intelligence briefing on the Russo-Ukraine war. Um, before I start on that part, I should start, uh, I guess I should explain why I think I'm qualified to do this. Uh, and the basic reason is, back in the 1970s and 1980s, I spent a lot of time playing World War II era war games set in Eastern Europe, including Russia. And I read a lot of military history, and later on, I read a lot of general history, and I learned about things like the Kievan Rus. We'll get back to the Kievan Rus. The Kievan Rus is important. Um, so that's my qualifications for giving this talk. I learned enough military art, and I read enough history, and I've been paying attention. And I have been talking about, I've been talking about this talk with people at this conference. I've been taking note of the questions they ask. So, the first thing I'm going to cover in this talk is something I wasn't expecting to have to talk about at all, which is how to tell truth from bullshit. This is a war in which both sides are engaging in uh, information war with a lot of determination and a lot of intensity. It's also a war in which the information channel is particularly important because one side of the conflict is completely dependent on good political relations with its arms suppliers. If the West stopped shipping weapons to the Ukraine at all uh, tomorrow, as they would essentially have no hope of holding out against the brutality that uh, the Russians know how to bring to bear. So, the Ukrainians are very, very focused on keeping a positive public image in the West, and Russian propaganda is very, very focused on trying to tear down that image and present the support for the Ukraine as futile, so that the political consensus that is sending them artillery shells will collapse, and the Russians will be able to do what they think they can do. Um, so in this kind of supercharged, propaganda-heavy envir uh, environment, it's important to know how to tell the truth from the bullshitters. And I'm going to tell you a couple, uh, uh, the main trick that I believe intelligence analysts use, I've never formally been an intelligence analyst, but I've read about what they do. And to get a feeling for who tells the truth and who lies, here's what you do. You keep track of their claims about the state of the battlefield, both military and political, over a long period of time. You treat each claim as a prediction of future consequences. Like, if one side says, forces from red team have seized the Fubar Heights, that seizure is going to have consequences. If that claim is correct, then in the future, red team is going to attack down off the Fubar Heights in an advantageous direction, because that's why you seize high ground. You get fire control of places that you want to control. If the claim that red team forces have seized the Fubar Heights is false, you will see no news of any tactical action that depends on control of the Fubar Heights. So, you can check these battlefield claims as predictions, and if you do this over a longer period of time, you will get a feel for who is usually telling the truth and who is lying through their teeth. Um, so let me tell you the most general thing about that. In general, although there are specific reasons I can call out where they have, this hasn't been the case, the Ukrainians are pretty truthful. The reason for this is uh, it's a function of their political vulnerability. They know that they must keep 
their image as the good guy, the wronged party, the people who are fighting a clean defensive war. The short-term gain from any short-term gain they might achieve from propaganda lies in general isn't really worth the political risk if they lose that image. On the other hand, in general, the Russian Ministry of Defense lies through its teeth, routinely, big time, because there's no, there's no consequences for, for lying for them other than whatever short-term uh, advantage they might gain from being, having the propaganda believed. Um, so, in general, verify everything you can. Don't uh, naively trust anything the Ukrainians say because there are specific circumstances under which they will lie, quite freely and boldly and largely. They will do it for purposes of what Russians call maskirovka, tactical or operational deception. This is when you create a false picture of what you are trying to do so that the enemy will respond to that and not be prepared to do what you are actually planning. The Ukrainians will engage in Maskarovka. They do it regularly. They're actually not as good at it as the Russians are, but they're not bad at it. The thing is, that can be spotted, because if you are a student of military history and you know how combined arms warfare works, you can look at a map and you can look at the disposition of known forces and you can figure out what the, most, the next most likely thing to happen is. And if the Ukrainians then come out and, do, uh, and say, we're about to do something fantastically unlikely and stupid, you can look at that and you can say, yeah, that's probably a head fake. Uh, and I guess the most useful thing to, um, I can say to bolster my own credentials, if you believe me, is that so far when I've, uh, when I've told my friends, yeah, this is bullshit, I've generally been correct about that. This is not magic. It's not a superpower. This is what people who perform intelligence analysis for the military actually do. I just don't happen to get paid to do it. I do it because I'm an old war gamer, and I, you know, I kind of wish my extensive knowledge of armored warfare near Kursk had never become relevant again, but it's 2023, and here we are. So, there's, that probably, I hope that answers the, the biggest question people have been popping at me this, this conference. Anybody have any questions at this point? Any topic you'd particularly like to raise? What do you see will happen is if, say, there is a Republican victory versus a Democratic victory in the next election, and what effect will that have on the war, do you think? Um, I don't think that's going to have much effect because despite the presence of, despite the existence of a Republican minority that is opposed to supporting Ukraine, <clears throat> and there, um, the geopolitical reasons for the U.S. to continue are simply, they're too strong, they're too compelling. Uh, there's not much in domestic politics that's going to make those reasons go away. Um, I will only say about that also that the people, the minority of Republicans who, um, who don't want to support the war are basically in the position uh, of saying, well, They've lied to us about everything else. They must be lying about Ukraine, too. I do not think this is a completely unreasonable position. But now let's talk about, I, I, I told you we'd come back to the Kievan Rus. Oh, wait, uh, I have. Yeah, I sure. Have. Uh, so uh, I am, uh, like, at the start of uh, the war, uh, I and, of course, a lot of other people were uh, concerned that uh, this could uh, create uh, World War III. Right. That uh, hasn't really happened uh, yet, but what I'm wondering is, li like, what can the West uh, do to, uh, like, support Ukraine without, like, without it erupting into World War III? 
and uh, how how likely do you think it is that uh, that this could start World War III? And that's the second most frequent question I've gotten from people who are anticipating my talk. So I'll address right, that right now. Everybody's worried about nuclear ex escalation. <clears throat> so here's the thing for you to take home and think about that'll make you feel a little happy about a little happier about that. The irreducible reality <clears throat> is that nothing can protect us from nuclear exchange if Putin goes crazy. That is a brute fact with which we must deal. <clears throat> there is an outside possibility that he will develop a serious case of Fuhrer bunker syndrome and decide to pull the world down around his ears. Barring that, there are very sound reasons for the Russians not to start a nuclear exchange and for the people around Putin to give him a nine millimeter cerebral hemorrhage if he tries it. And that's this. Despite Russia's huge size in land area, Russia has always been far more vulnerable to even a limited nuclear exchange than the US and the Western allies are. And here's why this is. To take out Russia, you basically only need to flatten two cities. It used to be three cities. The third one was Kiev. Um, to take out Russia, you only need to be able to flatten two cities, Moscow and St. Petersburg. The Russian government's governance structure and the economy is so centralized on those, three, on those two cities that most of the people outside the immediate area of, con of control of those cities don't even have running water. They are literally living at a 19th century peasant level with some modern clothes and the occasional smartphone. Yeah. Uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, uh, retired former head of command for the U.S. and Europe. His big gripe with the war is that the U.S. has never declared a strategic objective. It's just said, we're going to help Ukraine as long as it takes and not, we're here until Ukraine wins. Right. Um, his, his theory is that the U.S. doesn't do this because it is concerned about what Russia looks like if they lose. Did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll talk about that, but I'd like to defer future and Russian Federation breakup to, uh, uh, towards the end of the talk because there's some history that's useful to inform that. For the moment, I just want to reinforce the point that you can take out Russia by flattening two cities. There is no equivalent to cities in the United States or the Western Alliance that you could take out and their war effort would collapse. The, the truth that the Russians have to deal with is that the U.S. is a lot more, even the U.S. on its own, let alone NATO, is a lot more resilient in the face of a nuclear exchange than the Russians are. And that means that if they start something like that, they're going to lose. So. That's the rational calculation. We, don't have, we shouldn't worry so much about a nuclear exchange. There are some others, but that's the big one. That being said, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say there isn't a risk if Putin goes completely bug fuck. Is that an answer to your question? Uh, I, I think so, yeah. OK. So uh, if you want to understand what the possibilities in the event of a breakup of a Russian Federation are, it helps to understand how we got here, why Russia looks the way it does geopolitically. And that's why it all goes back to the cave in Rus. <clears throat> in the late ninth century, what is now Russia was essentially a wilderness of small settlements trying to eke out a living and being constantly raided by horse barbarians from the steppes. Uh, um, not the Mongols. The Mongols came later. Um, through this, we have a map of Russia. Oh, that's great. Okay. Um, let's see if I can zoom this out because it'll be helpful if we can... Not a touchscreen. Not a touchscreen, right. All right. So here we are looking at Russia without the roads and maps. <coughs> Um, 
very early in <coughs> the Viking era, when um, <coughs> Vikings were raiding overseas and being the terror of Western Europe, there were Swedish Vikings who were developing a trade route down to um, what was then the, uh, the, the Byzantine Empire, located, centered on what's now Turkey. Um, what they would do is they would take their ships, you can look at Stockholm and take that as a departure point for your typical uh, Swedish Viking. They would run their ships up the Baltic Sea to the mouth of a couple of rivers there uh, and their ships being shallow draft, they could go all the way up the rivers to the headwaters where it was a fairly short portage from those headwaters to the upper reaches of the Dnieper River. Now it's fashionable to say Dnipro, which is the Ukrainian pronunciation. I may slip and use either. Um, <clears throat> once you got on the, the Dnieper, it was an easy trip all the way down the Dnieper to the Black Sea to Constantinople where you could trade your, your furs or your slaves or your gold or whatever and take back whatever you were interested in acquiring. We know this trade happened uh, in significant volume because uh, Viking grave hoards contained th things like um, Persian and Islamic coinage and in at least one celebrated case, an image of the Buddha. So there was a flourishing trade over these river roads and at one point in the late 19th century, <clears throat> the locals, having gotten used to these um, Vikings coming through, got fed up with not having competent military leadership and said to uh, the war leader of one of the Viking bands, please stay here and rule us and help us fight off the nomads. Well, they did. That was the foundation of the state which is known to historians as the Kievan Rus, uh, it wasn't initially based in Kiev. It was initially based in a city further north that I've forgotten the name of. I don't think it was Novgorod. Um, but um, the Vikings founded a dynasty. They very quickly became Slavicized. The funny thing about the Vikings, wherever they actually conquered Normandy, Sicily, um, Eastern Central Europe, they very quickly lost their language and their religion and became nativized. And so it happened here. The, uh, the Vikings became Slavicized and founded uh, a, uh, a kind of an empire which ruled much of what is now eastern and, and northern Russia. And it was uh, centered on the city of Kiev in the, in the Ukraine, which is, Kiev is a very old city by European standards. Um, the Kievan Rus had a glorious period, and then it fractionated into squirreling, quarreling Princetons. And then the Mongols showed up. <coughs> the Mongols being the uber supercharged steppe barbarians, which made every version from before that seem like a beta. Um, but before the Kiev and Rus got knocked over by the Mongols. This happened in the 1200s. They had founded a bunch of satellite princedoms all over um, western and northern Russia. And one of those satellite princedoms was a, a, at a little uh, timber harvesting town called Moscow. Small place at the time. Um, so the Kievans, the Kiev and Rus founds Moscow the princes or kniazes of Moscow. That's the Russian word. It doesn't really translate into English very well. Um, the the, the kniazes of Moscow were subordinate to the Rus, the, to the Kievan Rus. And by the way, Rus is an interesting story in itself. The, 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 the element Rus that shows up in the name Russia, Russia, and so forth, if you thought about it at all, you probably think it's related to the word for red because the Russians have always really liked the color red and they associate Rus with red themselves. However, that was not the original meaning of the word. Rus originally means rowers or oarsmen. That was what the, uh, the, the Slavs called the, the Vikings because that's how they traveled. So, the Kievan Rus founds a bunch of satellite princedoms, one of them at Moscow, 
And then the, Mos the, the, uh, the Mongols roll in and they smash the Kievan Rus flat. Burn its cities, slaughter its people, uh, take the remaining out, the outlying princedoms of the Rus as tributary states. Basically, you send us gold and furs and slaves every year or we'll come there and burn you out. Um, however, and even though this is true, and even though the, uh, the outlying princedoms, including Moscow, were tributary states of the, uh, of, of the Mongols for a long time, they never let go of the idea that they got their legitimacy from being the successors of the Rus. Kiev at this point had been burned flat, and um, Ukraine had been smashed into a war-plagued wilderness, a uh, situation which would continue to be the case until mm, late, in the 15th, late in the 16th century. Um, so the the the, the tsars, uh, the the princes who eventually became the tsars of all the Russias, their a lot of their legitimacy was founded in we are the nobles of the Kievan Rus. We're just temporarily inconvenienced because of those damn horse barbarians. This is actually relevant today. You know how this is relevant? How, this, how relevant this is can be told by the fact. That when I gave the first version of this talk last year, uh, the morning that I was to give it, I got a tweet informing me that the city council of Kiev had revoked the charter granted to the city of Moscow in the year 899 or something, and therefore the city of Moscow no longer exists. So we look at, yeah, we, we're Americans. We have almost no history. 250 years is nothing. We listen to something like that and laugh. In that, in that part of the world, in Eastern Europe, history never dies. The fact of the Russian claim to the succession of the Kievan Rus is still a live element of the regional politics. And it's one of the things that underpins Putin's expansionism. So, picking up the thread of our narrative, uh, the Mongols roll in, smash everybody flat. The Moscow is under tribute, um, but it's in a stronger position than most of the other princedoms, in part because it's further away and harder for the Mongols to get to. Um, Misery and privation and the Mongol yoke continue until one of the princes of Moscow gets militarily and economically strong enough to drive out the Mongol overlords, which have at that point become kind of fat and decadent, and successfully does so. He, it's, it's complicated. It's always complicated in, in Russian history, and it's tragic. But the really short version of the story is, in exchange for his success, he demanded the title of Tsar of all the Russias and absolute rule, absolute despotic rule, which had not before then been a feature of Russian political life. The, uh, the princes tended to have at least some degree of accountability to the powerful merchants and boyars in their city-states because that was the economy. If those people weren't behind you, you couldn't raise troops, you couldn't go f uh, fight Mongols, you couldn't go take over your neighbors, you couldn't do anything. So authority structure in, uh, in, in Russia used to be looser than it later became, but um, Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible in English. But the word Grozny doesn't quite mean terrible in Russian. It also has connotations of magnificent and awe-inspiring. Um, so Ivan Groz Groz Grozny successfully fights off the Mongols, gains absolute rule, 
and the state centered on Moscow, Moscow in the Great Russian Plain begins a slow process of expansion. That process, that same geopolitical dynamic is still going on today. And here's why. The, the problem with defending Moscow or any of the other cities on the Russian plain are that there are no natural defense lines there. The rivers aren't actually very effective. They, they can be bridged, they can be forded. What you really need to have a, a defensible position is a, what? Is a river and ideally a mountain range on one side of it. What is going on here? Okay. There are no natural defense lines on the Russian plain. This has had some consequences. One is that the Russians have been invaded over and over and over again. The Mongols did it. The Poles did it during the time of troubles. There was a brief period during which the kingdom of Poland actually held Moscow. The French did it. Napoleon tried, failed, but wreaked a lot of devastation while he did. The Germans did it twice. Um, this history has left the, the, the rulers of Russia, whatever the nominal current political system happens to be, very, very paranoid and very, very insistent on expanding until they control all the natural choke points guarding the access to the Russian plain. Unfortunately, one of those choke points, just to give you an example, is located in the western suburbs of Warsaw. And this illustrates the problem with Russian imperial strategy, which is that if you succeed in advancing to, those, to control those choke points, it's going to involve subjugating a lot of people who don't talk like Russians, don't feel like Russians, don't have history as, as Russians, and don't see any real reason that a Tsar in Moscow should tell them what to do. The result is that Russia, ever since it be began its expansion, has been in a situation of unstable empire, of which the communist bloc was only the second to last phase. The Russian empire is still unstable. There are still significant ethnicities within Russia who don't really see, see any reason why they should, they should uh, bow to Putin other than the fact that he's got the army and the secret police on his side. Oh well, that's a problem. Um, so yeah, so we've got, we've got this situation where they perpetually want to expand to these particular choke points. There's a guy named Peter Zion who does good videos about this. He's shaky about some other stuff, but he's very good about political geography. And you find, if you find his video on the nine choke points, one of them is in the western suburbs of Moscow, one of them is um, in a gap between the Black Sea and the Carpathian Mountains. There are several others in Asia. I don't remember where all of them are. Anyway, Putin is just like a Tsar in, which in, the, in that he thinks Russia's only security is to control them all. And he looks back with nostalgia to the Soviet Union, not because he was a secret policeman under communism. He doesn't care about communism. It's because that was the point at which the, 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 the Russian nation came closest to achieving its security goals historically. And Putin wants that back. And this is part of what I wanted to inform you about because most Americans don't understand that the Russian position about control of its, what it calls its near abroad, it's kind of evil, but it's not crazy. It's understandable if you know their history. They're going to behave that way unless they somehow get some cultural theory that they can be secure and uninvaded in some other way. So we've, now we, uh, we've, we've got the Russians successfully pushing back against, against the the, uh, the Mongols. I'm going to telescope a lot of history here because I want to focus back on the Ukraine and talk about the 
the rival claims of the Russians and the Polish-Lithuanian Empire. And this is a political unit almost nobody in the U.S. has ever heard of. How many people here ever heard of the Polish-Lithuanian Empire? Wow, that's a lot for a room this size. So the Polish-Lithuanian Empire, which actually originated as a Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth. I won't go into its detailed history, although that history is quite interesting. But they were a rival for influence in Eastern Europe and what is now Russia with the, uh, the, the, the Tsar for, oh, 250 years. The Russians eventually beat them. The Russians eventually co cooperated in the, in the dissection of the uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Empire. But one place where the Polish-Lithuanian Empire, Lithuanian Empire had particular influence was, duh, in the Ukraine. Now, in this period, up until fairly late, I described the, uh, the Ukraine as a howling wilderness. This had consequences. One of the consequences was the Cossacks. Here is how you make a Cossack. You start with a peasant somewhere in, in Great Russia or the Polish-Lithuanian Empire who uh, says to himself, my life is really shitty. In fact, it's so shitty that I would rather run off to a war-torn wilderness and risk my life fighting steppe nomads than live underneath this asshole who like whips me every Saturday. That's how you make a Cossack. The Cossacks are the peasants of European Russia and adjacent regions. I'm going to pull up that Zihan map for you. Okay. Who just could not stand the system, ran off into the war wilds to form their own communities, ended up largely adopting the military techniques of the steppe barbarians, which is why you know, your Cossack has a curved sword. It's a cavalry saber. He rides a horse. He's a, he, he fights exactly like a Khazar or a Mongol. Um, the Cossacks had a good run uh, for a couple hundred years. Eventually, the Russian Empire got powerful enough to subjugate them. Um, but that... Um, but even then, the bargain was partial. One of the things that the Cossacks were promised and actually kept was what was in the Russian legal system called personal freedom. This means that Cossacks, even after they were subjected to the, uh, the, the Russian Empire, answered to nobody but the Tsar himself. Not any of the layers of, of, of uh, aristocracy and uh, petty tyrants underneath the Tsar. Um, to the limited, ex well, I won't say limited anymore. It's not true. It was true three years ago. Ukraine has a strong national identity now. It didn't 10 years ago. But one of the things that will cause what anthropologists call eth ethnogenesis, the formation of a common culture, a, co a common identity as a people, one of the most reliable ways to produce ethnogenesis is to put a vaguely related uh, collection of peoples under common pressure, extinction pressure, from a major war. At which point they'll, they'll often decide what we have in common is more important than what separates us. We are a people now. This has happened over and over and over again. And in the last 10 years, we've seen it happen in the Ukraine. One of the consequences of the Polish-Ukrainian Empire is it had a lot of influence on the, the, um, the western end of Ukraine, um, with, and that has results you can still see in the, in, the, in the language. Like a lot of other languages, Ukrainian is a dialect continuum. The version, of the, uh, the version of the language spoken at one end of the country is pretty difficult for the version of the language spoken at the other end to understand. In the Ukrainian case, at the west end of the country, at the western and northern ends, Ukrainian is fairly heavily Polonized to the point where it's almost mutually intelligible with Polish. And then as you go east and south, it becomes more and more Russified to the point where at the eastern and southern end, it's far more mutually intelligible with, well, Russian. Um, 
And if you've already jumped ahead of the narration and realized that this is, was, is because of the tug of war for influence in the, in the wild lands between the Polish, Ukraine, the Polish Lithuanian Empire and the Tsars, take a gold star because that's exactly what it's a fossil of. Another consequence of the Polish Ukrainian Empire trying to Polonize everybody in the western end of the Ukraine is the Ukraine has always been a more cosmopolitan place, more open to trading influences and contact with the West than the Tsars were up until about 1700. In fact, that tradition goes back a lot longer because some of the founding cities of the Ukraine were actually Greek trading ports on the Black Sea and in what's what's now Crimea, and they had contact with the whole classical world. So one of the sources of political tension that used to be important in Ukraine, I don't think it is any longer, is there was some tension between the somewhat Polonized, partly Catholic, Lithuanian, Polish-Lithuanian-influenced West and the Russified East. Complicated by the fact that the east of the Ukraine is only recently a settled area. Remember when I told you that it was war wilds for a long time? Well, that didn't actually end, end until pretty, real, uh, pretty recently. There was, and may still be, a genre of, of films and, and uh, TV media in Russia called Wild Easterns. A Wild Eastern is a historical drama set in the war wilds of the eastern Ukraine at a time when it consisted of hardy bands of Russian and Ukrainian soldiers, uh, of settlers, trying to carve out a living and develop civilization in an area which was still subject to raiding from the steppe. I mean, the, the tribal names wielding the scimitars changed, but the basic problem didn't. Oh, and let me talk about that basic problem because this is one of the great drivers of world history that nobody knows about. The Eurasian steppe extends from, there's a mountain in Germany called the Brocken. It's in the Harz Mountains in, in north central Germany. If you go up, <clears throat> if you go up on, on the, uh, the, the Brocken, if you go to the summit of the Brocken and you could somehow see over the curve of the earth, you would see 2,000 miles of uninterrupted flatland before you got to the, rural, the, the Urals. That is the western end of the Eurasian steppe, a vast area of dry grassland, relatively dry grassland, that extends to the Urals. And then the Urals kind of half flatten out, the steppe extends through them, and all the way to the Sea of Japan. And an important thing to know, it, the, the, story, the story of Eurasian history is in significant part the story of, well, they had a nice civilization going, and then this band of raiders off the Euro Eurasian steppe showed up and burnt everything down, over and over and over again. So there's a reason this happens, and there's a reason the invasions are, are, are almost invariably east to west. It's because the... The, the further east you get, the drier the steppe gets because it's rain-shadowed from all the, all, all the terrain to the west of it, which means that if you are a random bunch of nomads with swords, the grass always looks greener to the west. Now think about that. You're a random bunch of nomads with swords. The grass always looks greener to the west. Much of history, much of Eurasian world history is explained by this simple fact. Um, where was I? Uh, Eurasian steppe, uh, Polish-Lithuanian Empire, oh, Wild East, yes. That was, why the, um, that was why the eastern part of the Ukraine was still the Wild East. Clear into the 19th century, these Wild Easterns are contemporary with American Wild West stories and to some degree actually patterned on them because that was a place where the whole nomad raid thing could still happen as late as the middle 1800s. Well, this is also, by the way, why the um, Russian Empire was dead set on conquering places like the Caucasus and Turkmenistan because that's where the raiders were coming from. 
That was the source of their problem. Um, so, and this segues neatly into the question of why does Ukraine have a separate national identity? And where did it come from? Well, part of it was from, part of it was from language. During the Russian imperial period, the, the, the title that the Tsar claimed was Tsar of all the Russias. Some of you may have heard that title before and, and scratched your head and wondered, there's more than one Russia? What are all the Russias? And I'm here to tell you, all of the Russias constitute Great Russia, which is the area in the Great Russian Plain around Moscow, White Russia, which is nowadays known by its modern name as Belarusia, and Little Russia, nowadays known as Ukraine. There was a am I running out of time here? Because I see people filtering in. What? Oh, that's a long time to cover the war news. Sorry, I've, I've, uh, well, this is the stuff you won't hear on the news, so you'll walk away knowing something. Uh, so I got I to gotta brutally truncate that part to say the Ukrainians ha had a separate national identity because of language and because of their connections to the, uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Empire, and they never quite forgot that, even though there was constant czarist propaganda to the effect that we're all Russians together. You're all Russians under the Tsar. And they did things like outlawing instruction in, instruction in Ukrainian and demanding that schools all teach Russian. And uh, that shit never works. <laughs> <coughs> Empires always try it and almost, it almost never succeeds. The Romans actually kind of pulled that off, but successors haven't tended to. So I've rambled about history too much. Uh, I should talk about what you probably came here, which is military operational analysis. I could do another hour on that. <laughs> um, so let's talk about how this war is, is, is similar to previous invasions and different from previous invasions. The reason it's similar to previous invasions is because remember when I talked about the whole Eurasian step being flat and absence of defense points? That means that combined arms warfare, mobile warfare, is always going to look pretty much the same no matter how's, who's doing it. It's the, it's the geography, stupid. Um, so we, we see themes, we see axes of advance being repeated over and over again in, in successive invasions. Um, even when there's lots of advancement in the weapons, the tactics, don't, tactics and operational level strategy don't change as much. The big change in this war is, of course, drones. I could talk another hour about those. Um, but here, let's see, what are the most important things to know about the war? Uh, you know, maybe I should take some more questions. What's the thing you want to know most about, about uh, military operations in the Russia-Ukraine war? Um, well, uh, not really like about the uh, operations of the war, but I was wondering like, um, uh, since this is like uh, at a tech uh, conference, like what uh, what like tech savvy people can do. We only have like, 15 minutes. Talk faster. What tech savvy people can do to uh, to like uh, help the the Ukrainians and like uh, support like the the war coming to an end. Uh, Unfortunately, the answer is not a whole hell of a lot. This is a war that is going to be decided on the battlefield and in places where politicians make decisions. And it's not one where we can have a lot of influence, unfortunately. My big question is, will, will Putin take an L on this? Like, I feel like it's not an option. And since it's essentially an anachronistic, futile desire on his part, because you know this groundwork doesn't, these, these choke points don't really matter at this point, will he take an L for something that's pretty much just a cultural desire? He's been doing it so far. Well, sure. But what I'm saying is, because it looks as though he's going to take an L objectively, 
Will he, do you think he's going to get killed and replaced or? Yeah, he's got the basic despot problem at this point, which is that so much of his prestige is bound up in a successful to the conclusion to the war. He can't back down. He, there either has to be crushing victory by one side or the other, or he has to die before the war can end. And there isn't going to be any crushing, crushing Russian victory. I could, I could go on about that for a while, too. So do you have a prognosis on who's going to replace him and what that means for us? No, I do not have that much insight into Russian politics. Um, um, what, would, uh, what do you think, like, a timeline of, like, when the war will end? Like, when, how long do you think it will last? There's no telling. It's not going to be short. What do you think uh, Russia's win condition is in the war? Is it just making it very hard to, like, protest Russia, or is it absolute conquest of all of Ukraine? Russians, Russia's own stated goals are that the Ukraine must, they've wavered between the Ukraine must be entirely con conquered or it can continue to exist as a powerless rump state with Russia in control of the Black Sea littoral as far west as Odessa. So essentially, yeah, the Russian, you, the Ukraine, Ukraine has to go away for the Russian war goals to be achieved. And in light of what I was explaining earlier about the, 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 the nine strategic points and the, the expansion desire, that makes sense in the larger historical context. Next question. Are so, I, before you ask, um, I'm, since we're running over time, um, any of you who are interested in hearing more about the strictly military side and some operational analysis, we'll find a BOF room after this, and we can discuss that. Okay, so just some congregate by the door or something. Anyway, next question. Uh, aside from drones and like you know, very hyper modern military uh, capacity, is there anything about this war that's different? from other wars that have been fought in the last, say, 25 years, 30 years? The extreme importance of the information space and the availability of open source intelligence, the fact that we can get video evidence of individual vehicle destruction, the fact that we have daily combat footage from the front, this, that's a difference that goes beyond the mere um, military utility of drones for things like artillery spotting. It changes the entire psychological context of the war. That's different. Next question. Uh, Russia seems to be fighting very heavily on the misinformation, uh, psych, you know, psy war, uh, thing and trying to influence the American public, the British public, so on. How do you separate out what is real and what is Russian mis oh, misinformation? Were you, were you back at the? Were you were not here back at the beginning of the talk because I talked about that a bit. You treat each side's cla fact claims as predictions. You treat every information source's fact claim as a prediction, and then you track the quality of the predictions over time. And after a while, you'll get a pretty good feel for who is usually telling the truth and who is usually lying. Next question. From a cyber warfare perspective, where like for instance, we saw level three and they lost two thirds of their bandwidth when the Western companies pulled out. And then you see companies like Microsoft and Amazon aiding side A or side B. What do you think the civilian effect of that is going to be as companies get drawn into this war from a cyber perspective? I don't know. I'd have to think about that and analyze some data. Somebody who hasn't asked a question before. 
you did talk about how you think Ukrainians are mostly credible yeah. in their propaganda, but do you think their uh, casualty numbers are credible? And to that end, can they support the war of attrition? Good question. Good. That was an excellent question. Thank you for bringing that up. Let's talk about casualty ratios and how you know uh, casualty claims are credible or not. So there are certain basic things that anybody who uh, studies military tactics or operational art learns. One of these is, you prob you've probably heard this rule of thumb, you need a three to one manpower advantage on the attack. Uh, another similar heuristic is if you send troops, especially troops that don't have enough uh, armor and artillery support against uh, fixed defenses manned by well-trained troops, you're going to have a bad time. And if you compound the error by conscripting people en masse, um, giving them nominal or no training, um, under-equipping them, and then shoveling them onto the front and saying, walk that way until you kill a Ukrainian, your casualty ratios are going to be horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. The Ukrainians are claiming that in Bakhmut, they were inflicting an, uh, a 7.5 to 1 casualty ratio against the Russian attackers. I'm here to tell you that that is entirely believable. In fact, as a military historian, I would expect that ratio to be higher, if anything. So, if anything, I think the fact that they claim it's only 7.5 to 1, that's an admission against interest. They could plausi plausibly claim that it's higher, which makes me believe that that's truthful. Now, um, an interesting thing that I picked up about that <coughs> is that um, uh, Prigozhin, the guy who runs the Wagner Group, he actually said publicly on Russian state media that at Bakhmut, they were taking 100 to 1 casualties. <coughs> he actually said that out where people could hear him. Now, do I believe 100 to 1? Yeah, that could be. It's a little higher than I'd expect, but not much. So I hope that's an answer to your question. Next question. You've, you've had too much time. Somebody else who hasn't asked a question. Hi. I think I've heard Zion say that whether Ukraine wins or loses the war, it's the end of Ukraine as a nation, essentially. What do you think is the long-term reality of Ukraine? He's got a case for that. Like the rest of Eastern Europe, um, Ukraine is in a very bad way. They're, repro they're not reproducing at above repro replacement rate. <clears throat> and they've lost something like 8 million refugees that have, uh, the, that have gone to take temporary refuge in Eastern Europe. Not all of them are coming back. Um, so Zion may be right. It may be the end of, of uh, the Ukraine as a nation. Um, what gets less emphasis is that it is even more certainly the end of the great Russians as a nation. And here's why. Russia is the only one of the Western allies that never got a baby boom after World War II. Why is this? Nobody's quite sure. Shitty political conditions, rampant alcoholism, I mean, it, there could be lots of reasons. The fact is, they never got a baby boom, and Russia, too, is in demographic decline, and they haven't helped matters any by shoveling huge numbers of their military men into a, into a meat grinder. So Zion may be right. This may be the end of U Ukraine as a nation. Even more certainly, it's the end of Russia. And that gets into the whole topic of the breakup of the Russian Federation, because a collapsing great Russian people cannot hold together an empire as large and ethnically various as the Russian Federation now is. And that's when things get kind of interesting because most of the nukes are located elsewhere. 
Yeah, it's something to sit and think. I hope the Russians are in, as incompetent as maintenance as they look. Otherwise, we could have a real problem in 15 years. So, next question. You back there. Uh, yeah, it was briefly mentioned uh, entities like Wagner Group. So the head of that organization has often made claims, statements on TV that seem counter to Russian interests, even going directly against Putin. How mm -hmm. is that being tolerated? How is that influencing the war? Do you see him coming to an end due to his behavior? It's, it's confusing to watch. It is very confusing. I said that I don't have a lot of insight into internal Russian politics, and I meant it. Um, in my own defense, I'll say that I don't think there are very many people anywhere who have insight into internal Russian politics, not excluding the Russians themselves. Um, Prigozhin is, clearly has some notion that he can somehow seize power. I, th I think he's completely deluded, especially since his, his army is now 